Welcome to First Presbyterian Church and to this service of worship for the week of Pentecost Sunday. As we begin, I'd like to thank Amy Shaw for providing music for us this week at the organ. Although if you were looking carefully at the shot from the camera as the prelude was being played, you didn't see Amy. She has been with us this week Thank you, thanks to the wonderful pre-recording feature that's part of our organ. We're very thankful for Amy coming and sharing in the Ministry of Music with us this week. For those of you who receive the weekly email from the church office, you will find there an invitation and an, an internet link to our virtual coffee hour. If you're able to, I would be wonderfully appreciative if you joined me for coffee, either on Sunday morning at 10.30, or if you've just watched this sometime on Monday and missed that one, we also meet at Wednesday morning at 10 o'clock, and I would love to have you join us for a time of fellowship. We gather on this Pentecost Sunday to celebrate the gift of God the Holy Spirit, who comes to gift and empower the people of God. Please join me in singing as we prepare to unite our hearts in worship, Spirit of the Living God. Please join me in the call to worship. Praise the Lord from whom all blessings flow. The day of Pentecost has come, and though we are in separate places, we are together in the one spirit of the living God. Praise the Lord who sends forth his spirit. Praise the Lord who renews the face of the earth. Jesus Christ, rain down your spirit that we too may see visions and dream dreams. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works. Praise the Lord. Praise the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord. Let us pray together. God of Pentecost, you pour out your power on your people. 
young and old, men and women, rich and poor, in all nations and among all peoples. Unite us, we pray, in the bonds of Christian love as we worship together, as we glory in your love, as we cry out to you for our hurting world. Come, Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Our hymn is number 332 in the hymnal, Let Every Christian Pray. scripture reading is the story of the day of Pentecost from the Acts of the Apostles. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. In our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others sneered and said, they are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. 
No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The second reading is from Paul's first letter to the church in Corinth. We'll be reading chapter 12, verses 4 through 13. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of services, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who activates all of them in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another by the same Spirit, faith. To another, gifts of healing by the one Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy to another the discernment of spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. All of these are activated by one and the same Spirit, who allots to each one individually just as the Spirit chooses. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in the one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we are all made to drink of one spirit. Please pray with me. God of Pentecost, Grant us the living presence of your Spirit in this reading and hearing and proclaiming of your word. Amen. Today is Pentecost, the day we often think of as the birthday of the church, the day the community of Jesus' followers in Jerusalem emerged in public for the first time. In this particular year, Pentecost comes while churches around our country and in many places around the world are trying to figure out how to relaunch our ministries as we gradually come out of our coronavirus isolation. In some ways, I can identify with the believers in Jerusalem, prayerfully together in that upper room with no roadmap to follow but hopeful and expectant that the Lord would do something to show them the way. If you have been able to follow the weekly emails I've been sending out or have read the bell tower, you're aware that our session has formed a small task force to create a roadmap of sorts for us. I think I'm speaking for this group in our session, but at least I'm speaking for myself as I say that I believe we need to be guided by two things in seeking this roadmap. The first is the best information and guidance we can get from our public health community. The second thing is simply the law of love. Any place disciples of Jesus gather together should be a safe place and an inclusive place. So how can we make our gathering safe for everyone who comes? 
And how can we include those among us who may not feel safe in any sort of gathering? Can we invite them in remotely? Or can we stay connected with them in other meaningful and personal ways? Maybe for many more months. Actually, when our task force met for the first time, we began with an even more basic question. What makes a church a church? And we looked briefly at two things. In our Presbyterian tradition, at the time of the Protestant Reformation, the Reformers formulated what we've come to know as the three marks or the three notes of the Reformed Church. They are, one, that the word of God is truly preached and heard. Number two, that the sacraments are rightly administered and received. And number three, that communities of disciples, that the community of disciples of Christ is nurtured in their faith. Wherever these things happen, the church is there. In a more local way, our church has a purpose statement that says, as followers of Jesus Christ, we will, by our intentional actions, seek a deeper relationship with God, listen for the Spirit's call to mission in our community, and prayerfully lead others to know the joy of God's love and to realize God's purpose for life's journey. It's not going too far to say that as long as we are doing these things faithfully, how and when and where we do them is all negotiable. From our two readings, we could add something even more basic and fundamental. The Church of Jesus Christ is only able to do any of these things as we are gifted and empowered by the Holy Spirit. And so after this long preface, let's reflect together on these two things, the power of the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Holy Spirit and their relationship to each other. The story of the coming of the Holy Spirit upon that first community of believers in Jerusalem on Pentecost is all about power. In fact, if we were transported into the scene by some sort of time machine, I suspect that most of us would find the whole thing very disorienting and disturbing. Flames of fire and the sound of roaring wind not to mention what we do if we heard one of those ancient Jews from Galilee speaking English. Their behavior that morning was so unusual that some of the people who were standing by were bewildered and in awe, while others thought they were drunk. But when Peter rises to speak, he points out that there were deep biblical roots for this sort of manifestation of the Spirit's power. He recalls for them the prophecy of Joel, of how God would pour out the Spirit on all flesh, accompanied by cosmic signs and wonders. And there was plenty of precedent in the stories of the prophets, even King Saul and King David. Stories of people being possessed by the Spirit's power, and other stories of the prophets doing things that left people in their time wondering whether they had become unhinged too. As we move from this strange world to today, there are a couple of important takeaways. The power of the Holy Spirit is God's gift to everyone who belongs to Jesus Christ, sons and daughters, slave and free, and maybe especially relevant for us, young and old. The power of the Spirit can touch every one of us. And this story also points us to what I called in a sermon last summer, the wildness of God. 
the power of the Holy Spirit at work in the church and in the world cannot be neatly regulated, organized, or controlled by us. As we hold on to these thoughts, in the reading from 1 Corinthians, Paul teaches that the power of the Spirit is activated or manifested in the church through the gifts God gives to his people. There is a lot in the list of gifts that Paul gives here that may take us back to that strange and wild world of the day of Pentecost. Gifts of healing and miracles and prophecy and speaking in tongues. This, however, is only one of several lists in Paul's letters. In Romans 12, the list includes serving, teaching, exhorting, giving, leadership, and compassion. In Ephesians 4, he says that the gifts God gave were that some would be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. The spirits of the, of the gifts of the Spirit are diverse. So perhaps the most important thing for us from 1 Corinthians 12 is verse 7. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. As with the power of the Holy Spirit, God gives the gifts of the Spirit to each one to men and women, to young and old, without regard for any human condition. And in the work of God in the world, the gifts and the power go hand in hand. In the New Revised Standard Version of verse 6, Paul says that the same God activates all of these gifts in everyone. The word translated activate is the source of our word energize. The gifts of God energized and empowered by the Holy Spirit are God's means of proclaiming his glorious good news and transforming the world. From the very beginning, the church has found a certain tension around this energizing work of the Spirit especially when it brushes up against that spirit's wild side. Paul writes about these gifts in 1 Corinthians 12. But in 1 Corinthians 14, he writes about gatherings of the community in Corinth that had become chaotic, with so many people speaking in tongues and prophesying that worship was turned into a babel. And so he teaches that those gifts need to be exercised in tandem with God's greatest gift, the gift of love. And he ends the chapter with what has become a sort of unofficial Presbyterian watchword. Let all things be done decently and in order. When a powerful river overflows its banks, it becomes something chaotic and even destructive. The same may be said of the power of the Holy Spirit. But the desire for decency and order can also have its negative effects. In fact, even in 1 Corinthians 14, Paul decides that some members of the church need to be controlled more than others, namely the women. Despite Joel's prophecy that both sons and daughters will prophesy, and Paul's own teaching that there is no distinction between male and female in the body of Christ, he instructs women to be silent in the church. So how do we do all these things faithfully? How do we let the Spirit move and do all things decently and in order? As with many things in the life of faith, we're called to a balancing act. How do we stay out of the Spirit's way? How do we let God manifest his gifts and power in the way God chooses? 
without everything descending into chaos and heresy. In my own journey, I first discovered my gifts for ministry and leadership on the more chaotic side of things. As a brand new Christian during my college years, I became connected to a campus fellowship group that was my lifeline through those years. We were about as diverse a group of Christians as you could find. We ranged from Catholics to Pentecostals to mainline Protestants to non-denominational folks of all sorts. When we met on Wednesday night, 40 or 50 of us, anyone who wanted to bring a guitar brought one. Even the ones who only knew three chords. We led each other in small group Bible studies and prayer meetings. Some of us gave Bible talks at those Wednesday night meetings. We organized evangelistic outreaches to the campus. Our affiliation with InterVarsity Christian Fellowship provided us with some coaching, but we were pretty much on our own, seeking the Spirit's leading in the best way we could. And to be honest, with all those young, immature Christians in the mix, some nutty things happened. But in that setting, I learned that I could teach the Bible, that I could lead in worship and prayer and be a leader of a community of Christians. But as I came into deeper contact with the church in its more formal manifestations, I quickly discovered a lot of disdain for this Wild West sort of Christian community. Later, as a field staff person with InterVarsity, my work was often seen as illegitimate by the denominational campus ministers. And I recall a nice Episcopalian lady telling me that if I wanted to be a minister, I should stop playing around at it and get ordained by a denomination, all decently and in order. As my journey continued, I found that by temperament, I'm more suited to the orderly ways of Presbyterians. But with that orderliness, even with our best intentions, can come control, especially the young, old controlling the young, and traditionalists controlling the visionaries. How can we cooperate with the Spirit to create enough space for each one who has been gifted by God to discover those gifts and to allow God to empower them to exercise those gifts? Everyone, men and women, young and old, whatever their human condition. It's no news that this is a major time of change in the life of the church in the world. Excuse me. It's no news that this is a major time of change in the life of the church in the world. Almost universally, we share concerns about the future of churches like ours. There are a lot of factors in this vast shifts in society and culture on a global scale. But in some respects, our penchant for decency and order has left us less adaptable than some of the more Wild West sorts of Christian bodies. Maybe the needs of this present moment, when many of our churches are discovering that they can't do it the old way, because they can no longer afford the services of an ordained minister working 40 to 60 hours a week, will open new spaces for the Spirit. Maybe having to live through this time of hibernation and then emerge from it 
will help create that space. Maybe it will lead Christians like us to discover gifts we didn't realize God has given us, gifts to lead worship and pray and teach and preach and witness and heal and encourage and show compassion, to see visions and dream dreams, all in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. Spirit of the living God, we praise and thank you for the gifts you pour out upon us, your people. We praise you that each one of us is gifted by you, that each one of us has received your power. Free us, we pray, from the things that bind us. Release in us your power to witness and serve, to seek justice and mercy, to proclaim the mighty acts of God in our troubled and chaotic world. We thank you for the signs of the Spirit's work in our lives this week, for the gifts that we have received of encouragement, of hope, of gifts that we have been able to use in the service of you and others. We thank you for moments when we have beheld your beauty, when we have experienced joy. And we pray today, among others, for our friend Reverend Olson and his family as they mourn the loss of Jim's sister. We pray for one of our members who is undergoing cataract surgery this week. And for all among us who need your healing touch in one way or another. We pray for the new graduates in our community, especially those who are moving on from school into the world of work at this particular time, that you might open doors for them, that they might not grow discouraged or lose heart. On the church's birthday, we pray for the church in this community, in all of its different varied manifestations, that you would empower us anew that you would unite us in the unity of the one spirit, that we would be able to see and recognize and celebrate the gifts of each part of your body. We pray also for our Presbyterian Church USA family throughout this nation. We pray for sisters and brothers in Christ wherever they gather in this world, we especially remember our brothers and sisters in Kiangwa Parish in Kenya as they go through the same sorts of things that we are going through in this time of pandemic. And we pray for our nation. Words, words fail me, Lord. In this week, when so much else is going on in our nation, in this pandemic. We pray in the aftermath of the death of George Floyd, for all the anger and violence that has grown out of it, violence begetting more violence, 
We pray in the short run for all that violence to cease, for calmer heads to prevail. We pray in the weeks ahead for justice to be done for George Floyd. And we pray for new ways of living together as a community of people in this nation. We pray for your church that we might be at the forefront of those seeking true reconciliation among people. And we pray all of this in the name of Jesus, our Savior, who taught us when we pray to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Join me in singing, every time I feel the Spirit moving in my heart, I will pray. of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all this day and forever. Amen. <laughs>